This collection of aluminum, glass, and semiconductors, what we call solar panels, are an amazing invention. They take sunlight and turn it into electricity. It was a dream of mine to get solar, and it's so satisfying to know that all of our family's electrical needs are covered by these solar panels that I was able to install myself. And not only does this system provide our electricity, it generates income, and sometimes the power company is paying us. I want to take you on the ultimate solar tour, show you around, answer your questions, and pull back the curtain on what some of these parts are and what they do. We'll start out on the roof where the magic happens and work our way out to the power company's meter where we'll find out how close I am to my goal of net zero after the two years that this system has been online. The first stop on our journey is up here on the roof with the solar panels. When I began this project, it was a challenge because I wanted to not only do it myself, but I wanted to have 100% of our electric bill covered. So I had to figure out a way to get enough solar panels up here on the roof to accomplish that goal. So I ended up getting 48 panels. 42 are on the main roof and the other six are here on the garage roof. And you add up all of that wattage and you get a system that can produce 15,600 watts. So why are my solar panels up on the roof? Why aren't they on the ground? Well, the main reason is that I have no room on the ground for the solar panels. I need them to face toward the equator, which for me is south facing, and my front yard has no room for solar panels. So the most economical place to put them is up here on the roof. Let's get a little closer view of these panels. If we take a look at the solar panel, you can see there's not much going on here. There's certainly no moving parts and there's a lot of empty space under here. These things are amazing and there really isn't much to their construction. If you look here, there's basically four main parts. There are a few more things, but basically four main parts. There's the aluminum frame, the glass on top, and they hold everything together and protect the solar cells. There are the solar cells themselves, and you can see each individual one here, and there's space in between. And this white thing is what you can see on the bottom which is called the back sheet. And this helps protect the solar cells from underneath. If we look from the top of the panels, you can make out the individual solar cells. In this model, there are 96 of them. And to give you a sense of the size and width, here's a solar cell that would never made it into a solar panel. You can see it's very thin, and the way that it works is that sunlight hits the top and photons knock electrons free and you get an electric current. Now most solar cells, like this or, or the ones on here, produce about half of a volt. And you can see this on my multimeter. The negative leads are on the front and the positive leads are on the back. This means for my Panasonic panels with 96 cells, I get a voltage of around 50 volts. So even as your tour guide, I learned something new here today. And unfortunately, some solar cells were harmed in the making of this video. I didn't realize how fragile these things are. I broke three of them by accident by trying to take them up to the roof. Two I dropped and one I broke because I was holding a few things and I had to keep going back to get another unbroken one. And seeing how fragile these things are shows me how important it is to have that strong glass and aluminum frame to protect them. Now the next part of the tour I want to point out is that you cannot see any wires or conduit when you look at the panels. Yes, there is this little conduit over here and I tried to make it white and blend in with the siding, but that is all you can see. And even from way up top, all the way across, you don't see any wires. What's under the solar panels? Well, let's take a look and see what we find. One of the first things we notice are these watertight junction boxes that I use to hide all of the wires and transition them through the roof. Also under the panels, we have the flashing and the mounts that hold up the rails. All of these are made out of aluminum, so they won't rust. We also have the power optimizers on the rail. And if you were to use a microinverter, it would look similar to this and sit just below the bottom of the panel. If you were to look straight up from the roof through the back of the solar panels, you can see light coming through the back sheet and this unique shape of the solar cells in this open space. Now take a guess and comment below why you think it's this shape. I'll explain why in a little bit. And also from underneath, you can faintly see these small wires connecting all the individual solar cells together. Next, let's go under the roof to see what it looks like from the bottom side, as well as what's in the garage and all those boxes and what do they do before we head back outside to the back of the house. But before we do that, let's hear from today's sponsor. This video has been sponsored by Audible. Audible is known for their audiobooks, even though they offer a whole lot more. And now's a great time for you to consider trying out Audible. If you're like our family, your summer travel last year was canceled, but this year, many of us are hitting the road and Audible can help out. We have five kids and here's our minivan. This trusty steed has played many audiobooks through its speakers and made family trips so much more enjoyable and educational. Audible has thousands of titles and so plenty to choose from if it's just the kids or you're all listening. 
When it's just me and I'm by myself, I like fiction when using Audible, and I recently started to re-listen to the latest book in the Mistborn series, and I can't wait for the sequel. Audible not only has thousands of audiobooks, they also offer access to popular podcasts, theatrical performances, comedy, and exclusive Audible originals found nowhere else. Again, now's a great time to check out Audible. New members can get 30 days of their newest plan, Audible Plus, for free. Just visit audible.com slash frugal or text frugal to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com slash frugal or text frugal to 500-500. We are now directly under the solar array in my attic, looking up at the roof trusses and the decking. When I first thought about installing solar myself, perhaps my biggest fear was my roof leaking. When I was drilling from above, I was afraid I would miss the truss and put an open hole right into my attic. Here's an example where you can see I missed and drilled the hole slightly to the side. But it's no problem though, because not only is it filled with watertight roofing caulk, it has that wide aluminum flashing over top of it. So looking at this scene, it reminds me that you can make mistakes and pretty much anyone can install solar themselves. And if I do get worried about leaks, I remind myself of all of these nails holding down the shingles coming through the roof, and none of them are filled with caulk. Under the garage roof, the flexible conduit comes down and goes over to this wire box where the wires for the two arrays come together and head to the inverters. Each of these inverters manage two strings of 12 solar panels each. Here's what it looks like inside one of these. The inverter takes in the two strings of 400 volts of direct current, and up here it converts that direct current to alternating current and synchronizes up with the power company's sine wave and outputs 240 volts AC down here. I also wired up a network connection for monitoring. I'm an information junkie and I love the access to all the data that this system provides and how I can even monitor each individual panel. For example, here's how much each panel has produced in the past month and these four produced the most. I don't see any problems, but if there were significant differences in power production, I would go and try to figure out why. Next to the inverters is this circuit breaker panel. Now why would I need this? In a solar installation, this is sometimes called a combiner box. One of its main roles is to take the four current carrying wires from the inverters, combine them all down into two wires, which we need to connect to the grid. It also provides a circuit breaker for each panel and a spot for this little strange bulb. Now you might ask, what would happen if there was a lightning strike nearby or a big power surge? That's what this little guy is for. It's called a surge arrester, and I have it here to protect the inverters. This thing is impressive, and according to the installation manual, it provides protection for a power surge up to 100,000 amps. And when the blue light is on, it's not the Kmart special, it actually means it's ready to handle any incoming power surges. If you've seen my installation video, you know I have a meter out back, so why do I have a second one here? This is called the production meter, and it lets me see how much the system has produced. I don't know if I actually needed this thing, but again, I'm an information junkie. Fun story though, when I went to turn on the whole system for the first time, I realized that this meter was broken, and even though it was new, I didn't want to wait to have to send it back and get a replacement. So I took it apart and fixed the loose connection, and it's been working great. Next on the tour, we go outside, but let's talk about the shape of the solar cell. What was your guess? Well, the reason why they're this shape is because they're made from monocrystalline silicon, which makes the solar cells more efficient. Here's a silicon ingot, and you can see it's made in the shape of a cylinder. So when it gets cut into thin slices, you have circles. But to maximize space and have them wired together efficiently, they're cut into this octagon shape to get the most power you can put inside a panel frame. Now, what if there was a fire or I had to turn off the system quickly or for maintenance? That's what this big switch here is for. You can turn everything off all at once, and if it's running, it shuts down quickly. And besides this on-off switch ability, inside here there are two special fuses for safety in case of a short circuit. Over here next to the safety switch is the power company's meter. A question I often get is, how do you connect to the power grid? Well, there are two main places. You can do it inside the house at your breaker panel, or you can wire your solar directly to the meter right here. My system is so large that I needed to connect to the grid right inside this box, and if you want to see how that works, check out my installation video. What I have here is a grid-tied system. So when it's dark, I'm able to draw power from the power company, and when I produce more energy than what I need, I'm able to send that back to the grid, and the cool part is, is that this meter records power in both directions. So let's see how we did after about two years of having solar. This was installed by the power company when the solar was turned on, and you can see we drew about 29 megawatt hours from the grid, but the solar array has sent back 30 megawatt hours, which means we produce more than what we used. And so the goal I had from the very beginning was accomplished. I was able to put in my own solar array myself. I put it on my to-do list. I was able to check it off and get 100% of our electricity bill covered. Check the video description down below for any resources. Let me know if you have any questions on anything you've seen here or any questions about solar in general, and I'll catch you later.